done with uh, block one and block two. So in this class, we will discuss block three, metaphysical poetry, block three, metaphysical poetry. Okay. So in this block, we'll be covering the poems of Andrew Marvel, John Dunn and her birth. Okay. So before discussing metaphysical poetry, let's discuss about the period from 1603 to 1700. So in the first block, we have uh, discussed uh, the 14th century, isn't it? Uh, period from 1340 to 1400, period of Chaucer. Thereafter, in block two, we have discussed period from 1558 to 1599, that is 1600, uh, age of Spencer or age of Elizabeth. I mean, Elizabethan era, golden period of English literature. So block three, you know, it covers the uh, period from 1603 to 1700. Actually, that it is not a single period, okay? So Jacobian, uh, yeah, Jacobian to restoration period. So this era, the period from Jacobian age to restoration is a long period. Okay, it's a long period of nearly 100 years. And this period can be further divided into, you know, from 1603 to 1625 is known as Jacobian age because uh, during that time, England was ruled by James I. Okay. Then period from 1625 to 1649 uh, was known as Carolan age. Carolan age because uh, at that time, England was under Charles I. So please note it, 16. Not three to 1625, Jacobian age ruled by James I. Then 1625 to 1649, Carolan age ruled by Charles I. Then, no, then 1649 to 1660, 16, I repeat, 1649 to 1660 is known as Commonwealth period. Commonwealth period or Protestant era uh, ruled by Oliver Cromwell. Okay, now. 1660 to 1685 is known as restoration era, restoration age. Okay, so the period of Charles II, Charles II, okay, Charles II was restored to the monarchy. Now, 1685 to 1688, uh, England was under James II, James II. Now, you know, from 1688 to 1700, a lot of uh, England has uh, witnessed a lot of political fields etc. So this is the brief summary of the period from 1603 to 1700. Anyway, let me tell you, during this time, England was politically unrest. Uh, England has, in, in this 100 years of time, England has witnessed, uh, you know, uh, England, uh, five different kings. Now, so, yeah. So, Carolyn poets. Carolyn poets are those poets, you know, who served and who wrote poetry under Charles I. Okay, so you know, many of our metaphysical poets, they fall into Carolyn era or the Carolyn age. They have lived through Carolyn age uh, and com during Commonwealth period. Yes, some of them were lucky enough to witness, uh, you know, what do you call, lucky enough to live and write during the reign of three kings, James I, Charles I, and Oliver Cromwell. Okay, now let's just discuss metaphysical poetry. So what do you know about metaphysical poetry? The term metaphysical poetry is used to refer to the poetry of 17th century poets. Okay, it's a particular group of poetry. I mean, metaphysical poets are those poets who lived in 17th century. Okay, their poetry tradition, their technique, their style, etc., are entirely different from their ancestors say like poets uh yeah elizabethan poets or poets at the time of chaucer okay so during you know uh elizabethan era those poets had a rigid uh, yeah their themes were like uh chivalric rustic themes pure romantic themes or full of patriotism you know uh it was um over flooded with emotion love etc okay Anyway, this metaphysical poetry uh, was started against uh, was started as a reaction against the Elizabethan poetry. Okay. Anyway, these poets replace such uh, over flooded emotions, feelings with 
uh, rationalism, reason, logic, with logical approach. Okay. So uh, these are the famous metaphysical poets. John Donne, Andrew Marvel, George Herbert, Richard Grasho, Abraham Coley, Henry Vaughan, Joan Cleveland, and Thomas Trahan. Okay, so these are the popular metaphysical poets. So among these poets, you have John Donne, Andrew Marvel, and George Herbert in your syllabus. Okay. Now, let's see what is metaphysical poetry. So the metaphysical, the term metaphysical poet was coined by uh, critics Sa Dr. Samuel Johnson. Okay, Doc Sa uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson of 18th century. Okay, uh, so he referred this term to address a group of 17th century poets whose works were characterized by following uh, features. Okay, so what are the common themes or common char uh, characteristics of metaphysical poetry? How it, uh, you know, uh, dif uh, differed from Elizabethan poetry. Let's see. So, you know, the metaphysical poet, uh, uh, I mean, poetry is full of inventive use of conceits. Conceit means, you know, uh, metaphysical conceit. That means uh, it won't be a simple comparison. Simile, we know what, the sim what a simile is. Simile is a direct comparison using as or, uh, the word as or like. And what is metaphor? Metaphor is also a direct comparison without as or like. But uh, metaphysical conceit is not like that. It is also a comparison, but a very clever comparison, an ingenious comparison where the poet will be comparing two unrelated things, but in, uh, in a more scientific way, in a more scientific way, unusual comparisons. Okay. Say like uh, you won't. Uh, you, uh, that is not a. That won't be a normal or a usual comparison. It will be far beyond the normal thinking level. Okay. Next one is in that poem. You can often see an argumentative or rational approach. Okay. Argumentative approach. Most of these poems are written in the form of you what would you call dramatic monologue. They will uh, either they will speak to their friend or will out or they'll be arguing about their concepts to someone okay anyway the speaker will be active but the listener will be inactive okay next is highly intellectualized themes okay i told you the themes of metaphysical poetry is entirely different from elizabethan era yes elizabethan era uh, we know what are the common themes back patriotism chivalry romance betrayal so these are, were the common themes, but in metaphysical poetry, even though they, de they dealt with the following things, they dealt in a different way. Now, complex and unique ideas. So even though they use the commonplace themes, the way of presentation is very different. Okay. Now, strange imagery, paradox. Yeah. Another feature of metaphysical poetry is paradox. Even though they intend something, uh, sometimes they will contradict their... Uh, to their own idea okay they will contradict uh, to what they say now colloquial diction and dramatic expression okay language is very simple then full of irony pun i mean wordplay wit then metrical flexibility yeah some of the poets have used different um what do you call meters mostly they have employed pentameter what do you call iambic pentameter it varies from iambic trimeter to iambic heptameter okay now, yeah, highly religious uh, stanza, musical in nature. So these are the common feature of metaphysical poetry. So if you're getting an essay question or an annotation, uh, try to include all these, what do you call, points in your annotation and essay questions. Okay, these are the major features of metaphysical poetry. Now, let's see what John's, uh, Samuel Johnson has uh, said about metaphysical poetry. I told you Samuel Johnson is the uh, one who has coined the term metaphysical poetry poetry okay so according to samuel johnson metaphysical poetry is the most heterogeneous ideas yoked by violence together okay to make to get uh, so has to render a clear picture to the reader meta means beyond and physical means beyond physical so you know it's a forceful comparison it is not a natural comparison say uh, in in ordinary com uh, what what in ordinary language you know or in ordinary level we'll be comparing a beautiful lady to a rose isn't it or a doubt like that that means a, a girl is as beautiful as or as beautiful as a rose as rosy as a rose 
or as delicate as a dove like that that is normal comparison but how about comparing love to that of a compass love to that of phoenix or love to that very union of love to that of a blood and fee so the comparison is a bit weird okay that is why they said that most heterogeneous idea that means unrelated ideas are yoked forcefully okay are forcefully compared so has to render a clear picture so the very benefit of comparing uh two unrelated ideas is that you know these type of comparison uh were able to render a, a good picture a clear picture to the reader okay that we will discuss in the poetry now what were the common themes okay themes were very much similar as that of the elizabethan poetry but the way of presentation is different okay spiritual and religious sentiments carpe diem platonic love sex philosophical and complex thoughts human existence so these are the major what do you call uh, themes in metaphysical poetry now what is the very use of metaphysical conceit so it is a unique quality of metaphysical i told you uh, it is a very unique feature of metaphysical poetry here the poet compares two dissimilar things two dissimilar things okay and i have already uh, given you an example see uh, in john dunn's valediction for burning morning the poet compares lovers to that of the two legs of a compass husband and wife he compares husband and wife to the two legs of a compass that is an extraordinary comparison so the very aim of metaphysical conceit or using metaphysical conceit in a poetry is to awaken the reader or to get them a clear picture of the situation now so john dunn john dunn is known as the father of metaphysical poetry okay he is known as the father of metaphysical poetry now dunn his poetry you know it is a bit different from others he, he is a bit sensual uh, his he has written uh, sen sensual poetry as well as what he call uh, religious poems also so you know um yeah his works include sonnets love poems religious poems latin translation epigrams etc etc okay and you know uh, he he was a priest okay he was a priest of uh, yeah priest in the church of england actually he reluctantly became the uh priest in the church of england he married and more in 16 not one actually she was a protestant and uh, he was a roman catholic and he married her uh, at the age of 31 in a chi uh, in childbirth and more passed away after yeah after uh, giving birth to 11 children she passed away in childbirth so you know uh, uh, yeah due to the you know he was asked to become a priest by the king so forcefully he was made a priest okay now sir robert drury of hoxted was the patron of john dunn so i have already told you in those time in order to flourish or in order to become a noticeable poet we need a patron or a, a sponsor or a financier to flourish now let's see the characteristics of john dunn's poetry so dunn's poems are characterized by abrupt openings and various paradox ironies and dislocation of every speech and tense okay so let me tell you almost all his poems starts with some dialogue as if he is talking to someone uh in canonization he's uh, he starts like as if he is arguing to his friend and uh, in valediction for the morning you know he is convinc convincing his uh, beloved like that so oh yeah his poem almost all his poems starts with a uh, as a, has that of in what do you call dramatic poems with a dialogue something like that now yeah uh, as i told you he started writing poems as a reaction against elizabethan conventions now themes were similar religious themes love themes sex and complicated philosophies okay and he is you know uh, notoriously famous for using um, metaphysical conceit 
Now let's discuss the poem, Canonization by John Donne, the first poem. So let's discuss. This is a very easy poem, very famous poem. So for God's sake, hold your tongue. Let me love or chide my palsy or my gout. My fa five gray hairs or ruin fortune flawed with health, your stake, your mind with art improve. Take you a course, get you a place. Observe his honor or his grace. Or think things real or stand face. Contemplate what you will approve or so will let me love. So see the first two lines. For God's sake, hold your tongue. This is what I call abrupt opening. Abrupt opening. So for God's sake, hold your tongue. Uh, he starts this po uh, poem as if he is talking to uh, his uh, someone, isn't it? Actually, no one is there, but he started this poem like that. Abrupt opening. So he's asking, he's pleading to his friend. Okay, st stop advising me. Let me love. Okay, you have n number of things to talk about. Why are you, you know, uh, preventing me from making love? Uh, see, you can either discuss about my disease like palsy, gout, or about my uh, gr um, growing gray hairs, or about ruined fortune. You have many things to uh, advise. Mm, you have uh, we have many things to give advice. Uh, why are you still, you know, pestering me uh, uh, with the topic of love? See, better you do one thing. You may take a course and improve your financial state. Okay. You may either take a course and get a job in the palace. So from there, you can observe King's face. See, if you if you study well uh, and if you get a job in the palace, obviously, you'll be able to please the king so that you can see the you can observe King uh, by sitting close to him and or else you, can, you will at least get a, a, his face in a stamped face. Stamped face means in coins. Okay. So contemplate what you will approve. So will you? So so you will let me love. So you can, you have n number of things to do and uh, discuss. Why are you discussing only about the love? Why are, why you are preventing me from making love? Please leave me alone. Let me see. Let me go in my way. Okay. Alas, alas, who is injured by my love? What merchant ship have my sighs drawn? Who says my tears have over? Float with uh yeah overflowed his ground when did my coals a forward spring remove when did the heat which my veins fill add one more to the plague bill soldiers find wars and lawyers find out still litigious men which quarrels more uh though she and i do love so see the structure of the second stanza it is uh, the figurative language is hyperbole hyperbole okay what is hyperbole hyperbole is the exaggeration of emotions okay basically exaggerating things so here he is asking alas alas he's asking again who is injured by my love see i and and more we are in love okay that's a noble feeling so who is injured by that we haven't drowned any merchant ship okay we are in love we haven't caused any merchant ship to drown uh yeah then no see no uh ground has been flooded with our love or with our tears. We haven't, you know, changed any seasons. Every summer, spring, winter, everything is uh, coming and going according to the, uh, what do you call, cosmic rules. Okay, everything is happening as per the cosmic rules. We haven't caused any change in the uh, natural process. When did the heat which, uh, which my veins fill and add one more to the plague bill see when did our passion uh i mean when did our passion make someone fall ill we haven't caused anyone uh to uh, fall ill okay now soldiers uh, find wars and lawyers find out still see soldiers are still engaged in wars so soldiers they are still fighting in the back uh in the field lawyers are still getting the client no, uh, yeah, everything is uh, happening as usual. Everything is, uh, what do you call, uh, happening as usual or moving uh, as usual, though she and I do love. So in this stanza, he says that nothing has changed. We, our, our love hasn't changed anything on earth. If, uh, every single thing on earth is happening as it has to be. Okay. Now, 
Stanza number three. Call us what you will. We are made such by love. Call her one and who, me another fly. We are tapers too and at our own cost die. And we in us fix the eagle and the dove. The phoenix will have more wit by us. We two being one are it. So to one natural thing both sexes fit. We die and rise the same and prove mysterious by this love. So again in this stanza, see, see this opening, a breath opening. Call us what you will. You can, okay, you may call whatever name you want. She call me one fly and she another and call we can, you can call me candles tapers candles which are burning uh, which are dying at their own cost isn't it when a candle is lighted what will happen it will melt at, at its own cost similarly we are lovers who are dying in our own passion or like uh, dying or rising in our own passion no one has anything to do with it we are eagle and dove. So we in us find eagle and dove. So eagle is the lover and dove is the beloved. So that shows the ferocious and the noble, what do you call it? The Polish quality in male and female. Phoenix riddle hath more wit by us we two being one are it. So this is a metaphysical conceit. You see the line, the phoenix riddle hath more wit. So if you're getting a question uh, to discuss, the metaphysical conceit in the canonization. This is the metaphysical conceit. Please note it. The phoenix riddle hath more weight by us. We two being one are in. That is, uh, hope you know what a phoenix is. Phoenix is a mythical bird. Uh, yeah, so phoenix, it, it is believed that phoenix has combined both sexes in it. Both male and female uh, sexes in it. So at the end of its lifespan, you know, it burns uh, itself. Thereafter, is it rises from its ashes, and it is believed to be uh, lived in the deserts of Arabia. Okay, so just like a phoenix bird, they are also mysterious. They are even though they are two bodies, two separate bodies, their soul is one. Their their soul has been uh, what do you call re, um, united to one. So at the end of their lifespan, they too will die like a phoenix bird, but they will rise from their ashes just like a phoenix we die and rise the same and prove mysterious by this love just like a phoenix bird we will live for our love and after our death we will also become mysterious by this love that means okay let's see we can die by it if, if not love by love and if unfit for tombs and hers our legend to uh, our legends be it will be fit for worse and if no piece of crown Nickel we prove we will build in sonnets and pretty rooms as well as well wrote on becomes the greatest ashes as half acre tombs and by these hints all shall approve our scan nice for love so see this if we can die by it if not live by love so the poet again says that see if you people are not allowing us to love and live for that of course we are ready to uh, die for it okay see great kings just like Shah Jahan hmm? uh, see for their love they have built tombs hmm? they have built tombs big big mansions for their beloved see we are not that rich to uh, make tombs and uh, fortress for our dear ones but see our legend be it will be fit for worse so but we will make small tombs or beautiful mas mansions in poetry for great people kings and uh, uh, yeah rich people and all they can uh perpetualize their love by building big big mansions like Taj Mahal or uh, monumental uh things like yeah what do you call it? Similar type of fortresses, okay. But we are not that rich or we are not that powerful. So we will be pretty happy if we are fit enough to be find some place in poems, love poems. If no piece of chronicle we approve, we will, we will build in sonnets pretty room. So, you know, a lot of uh, love stories, uh, legendary stories have, have been written by many poets, many historians, isn't it? See, if those people are not writing any chronicles or histories about our love, then we don't have any problem. We are pretty happy even if we get a space in sonnets. We don't and we don't want anyone to write histories or chronicles or legends about our love. We will be we will be even happy, you know, uh, if uh, if someone writes sonnets about us. 
as well as a well wrought on become the greatest ashes as half acre tomb see let me tell you so these small poems these small romantic poems will be as spacious and as beautiful as the well wrote on see after the death of uh, people particularly uh, in hinduism we will criminate the body thereafter we will collect the uh, we will collect the ashes in the urn isn't it thereafter we will what yeah uh we will immerse it in the water isn't it so similarly uh see let me tell you most of these metaphysical poet were well versed in um, uh, hindu mythology uh, yeah mythology and all so that is why that well wrote on concept is here so he says that if no one is writing any history or chronicles or legend about our love story we are pretty happy uh if someone writes a love poem about us okay and we will consider that love poem as a well wrote on um okay because see uh, that poem or uh, the small poem is equally uh, great as those ashes collected in urn or uh, tomb built in half acre lands okay so we don't have any kind of discrimination uh, discrimination uh, okay uh, that's the small love poem that small love poem that is written about them written about poet and his beloved is equally or it is as beautiful or as magnificent as ashes collected in the urn or say like tomb built in half acre land okay so later these love poems will be used as hymns by lovers in coming time in uh, after so many generations they will be elevated as gods okay gods of love so the current sonnets that is written for them will be used as hymns after so many years so they will be canonized but for love okay now the next answer and thus invoke as you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage you to whom love was peace that now is a rage who did the whole world soul contract and drew into glasses of your eyes so made such mirrors and such Uh, is that they did all to you epitomize countries towns courts back from above a pattern of your love so in this last stanza he says that he and his beloved yeah will be canonized they will be made saints by the lovers after their death those love poems will be used as hymns devotional songs and the lovers will uh, sing those songs in front of them and they will seek blessing from uh, bella uh, yeah poet and his beloved and yeah you whom reverend love made one another's hermitage so they will you know uh sung yeah they will uh, they will sing these type of hymns uh, say like beloved and his yeah beloved and the lover they have made hermitage that means palaces in each other's body you to whom love was peace to them love was uh peace now it has become a rage it has become a passion so yeah uh when yeah yeah for lover and his beloved love was a noble feeling a noble passion uh it was more or less peaceful in nature after years the very nature of love has changed now it has become a rage rage means it is not anger it is passion uh, okay now it has become very passionate who did the whole world soul contract and drew into the glasses of your eyes so you know beloved and his lover uh, sorry her lover they have you know contracted you know uh, encompass the whole world in each other's eye they can see the whole wo- world in each other's eye that they did all to you epitomize so you know so these lovers have epitomized all qualities of love so uh, lovers i mean people from countries towns court i mean lovers from villages towns and different countries will come in front of them uh, to beg what they call to seek blessings from them a, pa- a pattern of your love so bless us 
to enjoy uh, love just like you people enjoyed okay so that is the very summary of canonization canonization the title means elevating someone to the uh, level of priest or a saint not a priest saint saint okay so here both the lover and the beloved are canonized and they are saints now so all the lovers from countries towns villages etc are seeking their blessings so has to bless them to be more lucky in their love so that is the very summary of what do you call it? canonization hyperbole dramatic opening uh, a lot of pun wordplay metaphysical conceit i hope you have noticed various uh, techniques in uh, this poem isn't it it is far different from the one that you have learned in block 2 uh, that is epithalamian and prothalamian isn't it i'm moving on to the next poem a valediction for bring morning so yeah now let's discuss the poem has virtuous men passed mildly away this is the second poem okay second poem in the block as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to the souls to go while some of their sad friends do say the breath goes now and some say no so in this poem he is speaking to his wife i mean john don is speaking to his wife um in in this poem he is going somewhere he is parting his wife for a temporary uh pity so asking her to be quiet and calm to be composed okay in previous poem he is addressing his friend in this poem he is addressing his beloved so he says that as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go while some of their sad friends do say the breath goes now and some say no so you know uh, great people when they pass away from earth when they go they will not make any chaos confusions or what do you call they won't make any fuss isn't it making fuss or making noise is a matter of is a, is a thing to do with uh, lower class people or you know downtrodden class it is not meant for virtuous people when we leave or when we do something or when we pass away we mildly uh, pass away without making any fuss while some of their sad friends do say the breath goes now and some say no yeah it is natural when someone dies their friends will say oh no they will cry they will make you know they will make a scene but it is not that worthy for a virtuous man uh for virtuous man to do so so let us melt and make no noise no tears flood no sigh tempest move it were profanation of our joys to tell the light of our love so in the second stanza he says that okay see we are not ordinary people we are extra ordinary beings because we we are made so by love we are so refined in love we are not local lovers you know we are not uh, common place lovers who make a uh, fuss over small small uh, or silly silly trivial things okay we are above everything so we are see in the last poem we have seen that they themselves called uh, yeah they themselves called saints or canonized in with their love so here he says that now let us melt let us melt and make no noise no no need to cry and make uh, that uh, what do you call the ground flooded don't make the ground flooded with your uh, tears no need to sigh hmm? no need to sigh and cause a tempest see see again hyperbole no tear floods because we know that tear will never cause a flood similarly sigh will never cause a tempest so he is asking his wife not to cry and cause a flood not to sigh uh, and to cause tempest it will be a profanation of the joy if she cries and cause uh, if she cries and sigh obviously uh, it will be very disgraceful to their love isn't it uh, see they are above everything so they don't have to make each other understand that how much they love each other okay they know now moving of the earth brings harms and fears men reckon what it did and men but reputation of the spheres though greater far as innocent so let me tell you when earth moves see normally when earth moves we are not known we live a very casual what do you call a normal life but when earth moves um, in an unusual way that is earthquake isn't it uh, people become panic yeah 
the but in the case of those great spheres to say like jupiter sun venus when they move we are not uh, see we are not aware about it why those are greater spheres that greatest heavenly spheres so when great things move or great things happen you know we won't get an idea or we won't get a knowledge about it because you know great things uh, happen without alarming anyone without alarming anyone only great things take place okay similarly we too are what do you call extraordinary refined or some blind uh, things so we should not make fuss over silly matters does subnormally lovers love who saw a sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it so again he says that dull sublunary lovers dull sublunary lovers means ordinary lovers one whose uh, love is particularly based on physical matters sensual matters especially concentrated around the senses eyes nose ears lips skin etc for them maybe the removal of body will be a big thing see if a uh, beloved and lover if they are separated for a considerable period of time they will forget each other they will seek new partners it is natural because their love is based on senses okay uh, yeah but we are not like that our things are not elemented in physical aspects now but we by love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is in the assured of mind careless eyes lips and hands to miss so in this poem he says that see we are not like other sublunary lovers we are so much refined by love we are, our love is not based on senses we are so careless about eyes lips and hands so it, it doesn't matter uh, even if we uh, move from each other for a period of time you will be you will be in my heart and i too will be in yours okay our two souls therefore which are one though i must go and you're not yet a breach but an expansion like gold to a rethinness beat so look at here uh our two souls therefore which are one he says that our soul is not two but one though i must go and you're not yet a breach but an expansion so even though i'm going away from you now i'm i have to go away from you uh even though we are getting separated it is not actually a separation it is not actually a separation but it is an expansion just like a gold when it is you know uh yeah when a gold is beaten what will happen it will expand isn't it just like that oh we have a saving saying in english isn't what is it see absence is to what fire isn't it absence is like just like a fire say like uh it will spread more uh if your love or if your feeling is genuine when the when your object when your uh, object of desire yeah desire if it is not in your vicinity obviously you will miss it and you will seek it more so an absence for a temporary period is not an uh, separation or a what do you call yeah no the thing is not getting diminished but it is actually getting expanded okay a breach but an expansion like gold to airy thinness beat see the comparison over here a breach it's it's like a metaphysical conceit okay it's a metaphysical conceit Uh, um though i must go endure not yet a breach but an expansion even though i have to go and we are getting separated for a period of time it is not a separation it is not a breach but actually an expansion just like when gold is beaten it will get expanded isn't it similarly like that now they be two they are two so as if twin compasses are two thy soul the fixed foot makes no show to move but the if other do so yeah now he compares lovers that means he and his beloved to two 
legs of a compass. Okay, if someone says that we are two bodies, we are two separate bodies, okay, then we are two separate bodies, yes. But our soul, that is, we are united. Our, uh, we are united by our, yeah, our souls are united, just like a fixed food. So in the case of a compass, uh, yeah, it has a rotating leg and a fixed foot, isn't it? Fixed foot is the where uh, we place the pencil and the rot. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Fixed foot is the needle part, and the rotating uh, foot is where we place the pencil, isn't it? So you know, uh, when we fix the needle part uh, in the paper, the other rotating uh, hand will go around, isn't it? So he says that. Beloved and the lover, they are two legs of a compass, but they are united at the top, just like the compass, isn't it? Two legs are united at the top. Similarly, lover and his beloved, they are also united uh, in their soul. Okay, so makes no show to move and bad up if other do. So, you know. A circle will get only completed if the fixed foot is firm, and firm, isn't it? The moving foot cannot complete the circle until unless the fixed foot is firm. If fixed foot is very loose and if it is not firm, other won't, other won't be able to complete the circle. Similarly, once growth and loyalty, what you call, yeah, etc., dependent upon the other. And though it is in the center set, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and harkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. So just like the comp compass, see the fixed foot is beloved, okay? The needle part, the fixed foot is the beloved and the rotating leg is the lover. That is the poet. So he says that even though I'm roaming uh, here and there, I'm going dif uh, to different countries, See, my heart is always hearkened. My heart is always lean towards you. Okay. Lean towards the beloved. Lean towards the uh, love. Yeah. And more. So he says that it doesn't matter even, uh, even if I'm roaming here and there. But my heart always belongs to you. And, you know, we will get eventually united. Once my journey is completed. Yeah. Once I, come, uh, once I uh, have uh, done with my travel. Of course, I will come home and we will get re uh, reunited just like a compass, isn't it? After completing the circle, the two legs will come closer. Just like that, after doing my business, after doing my jobs, I will come back and we will get united once again. So no need to cry. Okay, this is a very simple poem, but the, the theme, the comparison, the technique, etc. are very innovative, in, isn't it? Yeah, so such will thou be to me who must like other food obliquely run. Thy firmness make my circle jess and makes me end where I begin. And in the last stanza, he says that, see, that is what I said. You are the other food, that you are the fixed food and the running food. It is your fidelity. It is your love that makes me come home back. Okay. So this is a short notice or advice or just like a warning. Okay, you have to be fiddle. You have to be very much devoted. It is your devotion. It is your fidelity or loyalty that make me come back to home. Okay, where I, that means, uh, you know, when will a circle will get, uh, yeah, when will a circle uh, get completed? When it come back to the original position where it has started. Isn't it same? Similarly, I will come back where I had begun. Now, uh, I hope, uh, have you understood the technique? Hello, hello, class. Let me ask you a question. If you have read the epithalamium, prothalamium, and uh, what do you call it? Also, Scandabury Tales, you might have seen a small difference. Have you seen the difference in language, style, and technique? Hello? No, I, I'm asking you the difference. Have you noticed that uh, change in the style, language, and technique? Uh, here, the approach is rational, inventive. Comparing to the Canterbury Tales. Yeah, Canterbury Tales, Epithalamium, and Prothalamium. It is more logical in nature. Okay. Now, the next poem is Flea. 
Okay. So I hope you got the idea. So I'm not going to read all these points. We have many more points to discuss in this session. So I'll be giving you a brief idea about all these points. Next poem is flea. The conceit. See the flea, flea, flea. Flea means a fly, an insect. Mark about this flea. Mark in this. How little that which thou denies me is. It suck me first and now sucks thee. And in this flea, uh, flea our two bloods mingle be. Thou know that this cannot be said. A sin nor shame nor loss of maiden head. Yet this enjoys before it grew. A pamper swells with one blood made of two. And this alas is more than we would do. Okay. So. Uh, in this poem. Uh, I told you Anne Moore is a protestant. Okay. So, you know, she denies all his sexual advances. She uh, denied him all uh, sexual flavors. So, you know, a poet is asking, see, even though you have denied me all these uh, favors, mark about this flea, mark in this. See, you and me are united in this flea. Because how little that which thou denies me is, it sucked me first. See, you, even though you have denied me all pleasures, this flea, this insect has sucked my blood. Hmm? This, uh, yeah, this insect has sucked my blood first, thereafter yours. So in this flea, uh, it is, yeah, your blood and my blood is mingled. Hmm? We have reunited, we have united in this flea, in this insect. So this flea is our marriage bed. Okay, this flea is our marriage bed. So you, you have already uh, yeah, uh, lost your maiden head, hmm? your virginity because of this flea. Anyway, this is not a shame. Uh, see, it is, it is not a sin or it is not a shame. Uh, no, you cannot consider you uh, have lost your virginity, yet this enjoys before it grew. Okay. And pampered the swell with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. So in this poem, yeah, he says he can, he's actually convincing his beloved to offer him all favors, which she is denying him. So even though she denies all those favors, see, ultimately what had happened, one flea has made it happen. The flea sucked beloved's blood and uh, lover's blood. Now they have got reunited in its body. Uh, it can be considered as their marriage bed. Okay. So in the second stanza, we can see that uh, Bilaud is a, a, a about to kill the flea. Then uh, the poet is giving her warning. See, see, by killing the flea, you are actually killing three people. You're killing the flea, you're killing me, and you're killing yourself. See, your parents have uh, restricted you. Uh, yes. In offering all those favors, but let me tell you, this is a noble feeling. And in the last answer, we can see that uh, poet assumes that, or okay, he talks in such a manner that Beloved has actually killed the flea and tainted her fingers, tainted her nails with uh, the blood of flea. So he says that you have done a big mistake, you have done a great crime, you you have actually not. Uh, mm, what you have not only killed the flea, but also you killed me and you, because me be this particular insect or the flea has uh, the blood of both the beloved and the what do you call or um, poet. So see the comparison. The metaphysical conceit is flea. Here it is flea. The sexual union of beloved and uh, lover is. Compared to the blood mingled in the flea. See, see, see the comparison? That is metaphysical conceit. Now the next poem is Twickenham Garden. Twickenham Garden is again a poem written by John Dunn. So while writing this poem, he was uh, in the garden of yeah, uh, his friend and patron. And uh, he was in a very dejected mood because his lover, his beloved, has denied him all favors and rejected his proposal. So, yeah, blasted with sighs and surrounded with tears. Hither I come to seek the springs. And at mine eyes and at mine ears, receive of such balms as cure everything 
but old self writer i do bring the spider love which transubstantiate all and can convert manna to gold and that is this palace may thoroughly be thought through paradise i have spent serpent brought so you know after getting rejected by the lover the loud poet comes into the twickenham garden okay he comes into the twickenham garden to get some solace uh, yeah to get some peace but he says that he has actually brought the serpent snake into the garden because a garden is very is a very beautiful place full of flowers greenery etc but this person's heart is very much poisoned very much dejected he was weighed down why he was weighed down or dejected or poisoned why because he was rejected by his lover or his beloved okay so even though he is sitting in a such a beautiful place he cannot enjoy the very ambience or the company of nature so he says that he has really poisoned the beautiful place he has brought serpent to that place okay so uh, yeah even though see receive such bombs else cure everything else normally if you uh, if you want some kind of change or happiness if you go to a uh, uh, yeah garden or a place full of plants flowers you will be very happy but in this particular situation it is not possible because he is a self traitor he has traitored himself yeah he has betrayed himself why he has brought serpent to such a beautiful place so that rejected love he compares the rejected see see he compares the rejected love to a snake his depressed heart to a snake because it it is the depressed feeling or depressed heart or rejected feeling that prevents him from um, becoming happy so he says that that depressed heart is powerful enough to make poison a drop of poison is enough to make manna to gall manna to, so manna is the heavenly food given uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, by jesus christ to his subjects isn't it a heavenly food means uh, yeah when one is hungry the food that is thrown from or drained from heaven is said to be manna so a drop of blood is enough to sorry a drop of poison is enough to poison any heavenly food so he says that the dejected feeling or the rejected feeling is the uh, snake which can turn all his happiness into sorrow that is why he calls it what he call it? snake uh so even though this is a true uh, paradise even though this garden is a paradise i have brought the serpent so in the next couple of lines you can see that see he is asking the other lovers to come and taste his tears he says that he calls in paragraph number 2 he says other lovers you may you may please come and uh, taste my tears you may please collect it in a vessel and uh, please try to trace your beloved's tears if 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 it doesn't taste as similar as that of mine then all their tears are fake and see poet is calling poet is advising other young lovers do not trust women or do not trust your lovers because all those ladies are fake they are so cruel hmm uh, if you want to confirm it just taste my tears and just and taste your beloved's tears if they don't uh taste alike then they are all fake and in the third stanza we can see that he is again trying to convince his lover okay okay i have in uh told anything bad about you see other women are fake uh, what you call fake cruel uh and mean but you are not like that i have in mentioned about it uh but you will i know you are uh preventing just because of your situation if you uh, if you are getting an opportunity obviously you will uh, grant me all those favors so that is the very uh just of twick and ham garden and the metaphysical conceit over here is the poet compares the dejected love dejected love to that of a snake now the next poem is good morrow so in good morrow yeah uh let's start the poem i wonder by my troth what thou and i did till we love we are not weaned till then we but suck on country's pleasure childishly or snorted we live in the seven sleepers den it was so but this all pleasures fancies be if ever any 
beauty i did see which i desired and got it was but a dream of thee so good morrow means good morning hmm? good tomorrow beautiful tomorrow a oh, good morning okay actually good morning so the poet here says that i am really wondered hmm? I, i i actually i was wondering what we were doing until we uh, met poet is uh, is uh, yeah saying this to his beloved what we were doing until we met poet says that according to yeah according to john dun he says that he and his beloved uh, were simply wasting their time they haven't actually enjoyed the world they were simply babies until they were uh, they, uh, until they met see we were not been till then but sucked on country's pleasure stylishly we were roaming here and there we were simply sucking the plush country pleasures just like Uh, a baby um, is fed by the mother okay we were we were infants we were babies hmm? sucking the milk of uh, the mother okay until we met we were doing that we we uh, we have in actually grown up or snorted we in the seven sleepers then or we are those seven sleepers in bible so you might have heard about that biblical character seven sleepers So yeah, yeah. Those seven sleepers, uh, they have slept for two hundred years uh, in a den. Actually, these were there was a king, and the king was very uh, tyrannous, was very rigid, and he asked the seven sleepers to yeah those people to be killed, and so they take refuge in a cave, and the God made them to sleep for two hundred years. So after two hundred years, you know, they were. they have awakened and they came out of the den and they went to the market to purchase something when they have ex- uh, yeah when they have exchanged the gold coin the shopkeeper was shocked to see the coins that was a gold coin which was in use 200 years ago then only they understood that they were sleeping for nearly 200 years so similarly like that poet and his beloved were sleeping for a long time until they meet okay until they uh, met each other uh, they were sleeping it was so but this all pleasures fancy be if ever any beauty i did see which i decide i got it was a dream of thee okay so everything that we have seen enjoyed until we uh, met was just like a dream hmm? just like a dream or something that we have seen in a uh, in our sleep hmm? it wasn't true so the true story starts after uh they met each other okay so in the coming stanza you can see that see different people have different hobbies say like some are interested in traveling some are interested in politics uh yeah some are interested in exploring the world yeah but you know uh he says that to belau for me my world is you and for you my uh, your world is me and you uh, he compares his beloved to the southern hemisphere and he compares himself to the northern hemisphere there are two sides of a globe beloved and the lover are two sides of a globe and they are fixed into a single sphere okay that is the comparison metaphysical conceit here uh beloved and poet are compared to a two different spheres uh, two spheres of the globe they are combined and they don't have to travel around the world so has to see the so has to see and enjoy the nature they don't have to travel around the world but they can enjoy the pleasure or the so called thing in each other's body in each other's eyes okay so that is the very summary of good morrow good morrow means good morning poet is actually saying good morning to his lover when do we say actually good morning when we woke up isn't it when we woke up we say good morning to uh, our dear ones near ones or whatever the one who we meet isn't it similarly poet when he uh, yeah when he wakes up he says good morning to his beloved because according to him they were sleeping until they were okay met okay until they were met uh, they were sleeping now the next poem is ecstasy 
ecstasy you know uh it's a euphoric state uh a transubstantiate state you're transferring your body to a higher kind of thing you're coming out of a body and uh, reaching a different level when do we actually come out of your body according to the poet we can reach god in two ways either through spiritual means or through living a worldly life isn't it there are two two types of pleasures are possible really through religious way and through physical ways sexual ways isn't it so in in these both cases our soul, soul will come out of our body and it will reach a transubstantiate state ecstasy that ex, uh, that happiness okay that extraordinary intense uh, feeling is said to be ecstasy so we're like a pillow on a bed a pregnant bank swelled up to rest the violets a recycling head sadly to one another's best our hands were firmly cemented with fast bombs with dense dead spring our eyes beams twist yeah twisted and they tread our eyes upon one double string so to integrate our hands as yet was all the means to make us one and pictures in our eyes to get was all our propagation so in this poem uh he says that see bilal and the poet they were sitting on the bank of a river okay like a pillow on a bed a pregnant bank swells up to the rest so that bank is the bed hmm? it serves as the bed and there are so many flowers yeah uh, beautifully colored flowers and he says that the bank is actually pregnant so he brings sexual connotations over here the violet recycling head sadly to one another's best so a lover and beloved they are so chained to each other they are sitting next to each other uh, yeah holding the hands as if it uh, it was cement, uh, those hands were cemented with fast bombs with dense did the spring our eyes twisted and did thread our eyes upon one double string and he says that they are so they are sitting so close their their bodies have been uh, uh, cemented you know that much they are attached and closed and uh, their eyes he compares their eyes to that of the beads in a string they are uh, so connected to each other's eyes they are looking into each other's eyes just like uh, beads on a string okay so to integrate our hands as yet was all mean to make us one and pictures in our eyes to get was all our propagations okay so they are uh, you know very much into each other uh here violet flower stands for asexual reproduction not a sexual reproduction asexual ones you might have learned in biology sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction so you know uh, they are, they they have held each other's hand they have looked into now they are looking into each other's eyes so indirectly he says that even though they are uh, not making a exact uh, contact still they are able to propagate all their feelings with the eyes okay they are able to understand what each other feels through the medium of their eyes now uh, so he says that in that feeling uh, so they are so close isn't it so their body they have reached that substantiate level they have reached uh, reached the pinnacle level of pressure pressure okay so their soul has come out of their body uh i hope you understood it is not a sexual one but uh a spiritual type of love uh, as they are so much into each other's soul their soul has come out of their body just like a bird that is sitting on the uh top of a tree now their soul has reunited to a single soul see their own soul individual soul has got some type of folly some type of mistakes both lover and the beloved they have their own problem their own mistakes okay but when it comes out when their soul come out of their body and when it is fused together all their follies all their mistakes uh, have balanced hmm? e uh, each of them yeah each of uh, each of them have balanced all those small small mistakes and now they have become a better soul a better being okay 
just like you know in the case of gold or other metals you know gold is very shiny very costly very expensive but when so has to make it more uh, durable we will add some copper silver isn't it similarly uh, they too have become what better by merging their soul that is the theme of ecstasy so they have reached that transubstantiate state to a divine state uh, to a divine realm okay by propagating their soul okay the next poem is batter my heart this is also a metaphysical poem batter see batter my heart is the the title itself you can see batter what is a batter a dough that we used to make the cake isn't it yeah so here a uh, poet is addressing the three figured deity isn't it yeah batter three person god that is father son and the holy spirit in the previous poem he is addressing his beloved or other lovers or his friend but in this poem he is actually addressing the three person god that is father son and the holy spirit so in this poem he is very dejected he says that he has committed so many mistake so he wants a salvation so he is asking god to mend him to uh, purify him there is a three beautiful comparisons here three beautiful you know uh, yeah analogies are here that i may rise and stand overthrow me bend you forced to break blow burn and make me new i like an usurped town to another view labor to admit you but owe to no end reason your wise roar in me me should defend but is captive and prove weak or untrue i told you here he is addressing god specifically the three person god father son and holy spirit and he consider himself tainted impure as if he was occupied by satan or devil so he is asking god to renew him to purify him so he compares god to that of a general army general then he compares god to that of a um, what he called um one who makes the pot potter okay then again he compares god to that of a um husband okay or a beloved so he says that uh, his soul his body is very much tainted uh, first of all he compares himself to that of a country or a town which was occupied by enemies uh, or the say like satan okay so he is asking god to be uh, to become a general and to recapture the town he is asking god to usurp the town because he is the town and he has been occupied by satan or the devil or some enemy army so he is asking god to come and protect him by recapturing the town so god in the first level is a general in the second level he says that see uh, he has been violated he has been married of the, uh, he compares himself to a woman who has been married away against her wishes okay so he is asking he is uh, looking upon god as his lover who so come and cancel this marriage so during those time if the, if a woman is violated by some other man other than uh, her husband then the marriage will get cancelled isn't it so he compares see see john dun compares himself to that of a woman who has been married off against her wishes so he is asking god to come as his lover sorry yeah her, uh, his lover and to assault her okay to assault her so if god assaults him obviously the marriage will get cancelled and the next comparison is he compares himself to that of a flowed pottery hmm? a flowed pottery a pot so he is asking god to destroy that potter and to remold it again so has to become a flawless pot okay see the comparison first hand god is compared to a general in second level god is compared to a lover in third level god is compared to a potter and similarly poet is also compared to a town 
he compared himself to a town, then to a woman, then to a court. So basically, he is asking God to demolish the present state and to reconstruct him, to remold him by capturing the town. After capturing the town, he is asking to God to restate, to uh, to reconstruct that town. After asserting him, uh, he wanted to become the lover of the God. Then, uh, in the case of that pottery, he is asking God to demolish it, to destroy it, thereafter mold it again. It's a very beautiful poem. That is why batter my heart. His heart is already, you know, tainted, very impure. So he wanted God to destroy that heart and to make it in the form of a batter and to mold it again. That is a very theme that is running all throughout the poem. Very beautiful poem. Now, a hymn to, a hymn to God the Father. Will thou forgive the sin where I began, which was my sin, though it were done before? Will thou forgive that sin through which I run and do run still, though still I do deplore? When thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. So here he is asking, see, once again, pardon to God. So will thou forgive the sin where I have begun? So it is not the sin he has actually started. The sin, the original is, is sin was committed by Adam and Eve in the paradise, isn't it? Uh, in the garden, in the garden of Eden. So he's, he's asking God, is it okay? Will you be able to forgive the sin which my ancestors have begun? And it's, it is still continuing. Adam and Eve started, actually they initiated that sin in the, Adam, in the uh, garden of Eden. Will you be able to forgive that? Still, that sin is continuing, which was my sin, though it were done before. Okay, I too have committed the same mistake, but it was not me who have uh, who has actually initiated, but my ancestors have started it. Will thou forgive the uh, sin, the which I run and do uh, do run still, though still I deplore? So uh, again, he's asking, will you be able to forgive me, which the sin that I'm committing? or that which I'm going to do. He's not sure that whether he will stop uh, doing mistakes. We are human beings. Yeah, prone to follies. We will commit mistakes. It is obvious and normal. So he's asking God, is it possible for you to forgive for all my mistakes which I have committed, which I'm committing and which I have yet to commit? Okay, when thou hast done, thou heart has done, for I have more. Okay, I know uh, you will forgive and you know uh, I'm not a person who is not going to stop with that single mistake obviously uh, in, I will commit the chance of committing the mistake is more yeah so in the second stanza he is asking will thou forgive that sin where I have won others to sin and made my sin their door will thou forgive that sin which I did shun an year or two a while in the school thou shall done that uh, has not done though for I have more. So in the second stanza, he says that okay, will uh, I will you be able to forgive me for those mistakes which I have successfully come out? Uh, yeah, this person, even though he has committed a mistake, he has been very successful in it, and he has forced other people to do the same mistake. See, doing mistake is natural, but what about uh, forcing other to do the same mistake? It is more uh, serious, isn't it? So will you be able to forgive that? Okay. And he gives another scenario that, you know, uh, for two years, three years, for a short period of time, he has stayed away from all mistakes. He had been very good thereafter to compensate it. You know, he has immersed himself in all those sins and mistakes. So will he be able to forgive for all those mistakes? Again, in the last stanzas, it is a very short poem, okay, very short and simple poem. I have a sin of fear that when I have spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. Swear by self that at my death, thy sun shall shine as he shines now. And therefore, and having done that thou hast done, I fear no more. So let me tell you something. Almost all poems of John Donne has been adapted or improvised version of Petrarchan sonnets, Petrarch. Italian uh, poet Petrarch. Okay, Petrarch in sonnet. So Petrarchan sonnet, uh, the very scheme or the very pattern of the Petrarchan sonnet is octet, octet followed by a sestet. That means eight lines followed by a by six lines. So in basically in the those eight lines, 
lawyer will be asking so many questions okay many questions to, to the listener or to the reader thereafter in the six lines he will be giving answers octet followed by sestet uh, a b b a a b b a c d c d c d this is the query rhyming scheme of the petrarchan sonnet okay so john dunn has actually improvised the petrarchan version so he says that even though i have committed a lot of mistake hmm, i have a, a sin of fear that when i have spun my last thread i shall perish on the show so you know uh, when people see see they are conscious that they have committed a lot of, lot of mistake but at the time of death they all, we all will be you know scared of the mistakes that we have done while we were young and because and because we are so conscious in getting into the heaven we don't know whether we'll be permitted or not or whether we'll be perished uh, on the show so he's asking the god is it possible to forgive all my mistakes before entering the heaven or will you permit me to the heaven thereafter he uh, uh, yeah yeah he regathers all his strength okay i am not uh, afraid of anything because god the uh, yeah father son the holy spirit it is shining on my head so as long as their blessing is upon me i am not feared of anything i don't i'm not afraid of anything that is the very gist of him to god the father okay now this poem a nocturnal upon st lucy's day so this poem was written on october uh, december 13th the shortest day of the year we know that december days are shorter and nights are longer okay so st lucy is the god of you know desolation in mm, hopelessness winter etc so in this poem he is actually paying a tribute to st lucy at the same time uh, some people says that uh, he is paying a tribute to his patroness or uh, or uh, uh, he is uh, lamenting upon the death of his wife there are three type of uh, what do you call mm, critics have three versions some says that it is uh, addressed to goddess or the same lucy goddess of desolation despair winter etc then he says that he might have written this poem uh, to, uh as if giving a rich tribute to his patron pa not not patron pa patroness okay then others i mean another half of critics says that he has uh, yeah they say that uh, he has actually paying a rich tribute to his wife uh who had died at the age of 31 in childbirth okay so uh yeah he has written this poem in december on december 13th the shortest day of the year winter solstice so it is the year midnight and it is the day lucy's who scares even seven uh as herself unmask the sun is spent and now his flask send forth light scripts no constant rays the world's whole sap is sunk so he says that december 13th or the particular day so st lucy's day is the shortest day of the year so sun hardly shines for 7 hours okay similarly the yeah, sun is spent and now his flask send forth light scripts no constant rays so on this particular day there is no sun rays uh and apart the entire world is sunk when there is no sunlight the entire world will be immersed in darkness and here the poet says that see when there was sunlight his beloved was there just like in epithala uh, sorry spencer in his uh, sonnet number 77 hmm, where he compares his beloved to that of a pole star without the guidance of the pole star he will be wandering there in the uh, stormy sea similarly when the sun was there sun is he compares uh, his beloved to that of a sun okay so when there was sun he was very happy his days were so carefree she guided him um, in uh, everywhere and everything okay uh, but now sun hardly shines for 7 hours that means the world has uh, um, uh, has become dark or immersed in darkness that means now there is no one to guide him he is totally he is totally he is uh, he is utterly in darkness okay general bomb that hydro earth hath drunk whether has to the bed feet life is strong that an interrupter yet all these seem to laugh compared with me who am the epitaph so you know all other people so winter season is basically very romantic season where, where, where the, uh, while all other people are enjoying their life hmm? 
uh, sitting inside the room near the fireside or drinking wine they are making memories while the poet is you know is really weighed down why because he has lost his wife uh, and uh, see there are a lot of people not only him there are many other people who have uh, lost their beloved or dear ones uh, sometime they might have quarrel with their uh, broke up with her dear ones anyway that is a temporary separation but in the case of poet it is a permanent one uh, he has lost his wife so you know um a re uh, <clears throat> a re reunion is not possible so throughout the poem uh, he says son is none but his beloved okay but still he being very optimistic he says that some day he will be reunited with his beloved with his lover and she will be resurrected just like lazarus she too will be resurrected on that particular day he will get reunited to the son of his life saint lucy's day that is the really theme of the poem a nocturnal upon saint lucy's day so who's the nocturnal over here we know that nocturnal means ah yeah a creature that stays awake during night time isn't it so here the nocturnal is the poet he is the nocturnal he is the night creature that stays awake the entire night because he is so sleepless because he doesn't have his wife his beloved or his dear one to share that night so he is so very much dejected uh thinking about his lover he has lost the sun of his life but while others are enjoying their life he is sitting alone uh in the biting cold without any company but still he is very hopeful some day he will get reunited with his wife this is the very summary of a nocturnal upon the saint lucy's day so the next po po uh, poet is andre marvel andre marvel was an english poet uh, yeah metaphysical poet a satire satirist political writer and he was also the secretary of john milton let me tell you he has lived through the reign of charles first oliver cromwell and james first okay and yeah uh, he was lucky enough to live through all uh, the reign of these three kings and he is also very opportunist very ambitious because you know during uh, while he was in the court of charles first he has appreciated and he has written poems for charles first thereafter he followed oliver cromwell so he knows how to switch his uh, ideology and perspective according to the political changes in england now he has been uh, yeah he has worked as a tutor to many noble watts yeah now the very common features of marvel's poetry so even though the common uh, char yeah characteristics of these metaphysical poetries are same each and every poet has got their own techniques their own style let's see the style of marvel stretch metaphors yeah stretch metaphors logical and passionate arguments syllogistic style so syllogistic style means you know you might have done in logic and reasoning paper or in other cognitive exams after comparing so if a particular thing is this and an another thing is that and the third thing will be the the stuff that is common the two isn't it we are get uh, uh, yeah we are getting two scenarios where one something will be common in two cases and so the third thing will be the common case so the syllogistic style clarity control over words serious secular sincere in approach uh, flexible rhythms delicate melody fantastic conceit so these are the you know basically all these metaphysical poets are very scientific very rational in approach their poems are very easy to understand they are too good in convincing the reader without any doubt just like a mathematical problem mathematical uh, uh, yes uh, problem uh, they are able to convince the data without any uh, what do you call uh, confusion okay now the next the poem to his coy mistress so in his coy mistress he is addressing his beloved okay here he is addressing his beloved uh same way same topic same theme has that uh, uh uh that of we have studied in john dunn scanization um validation for bring morning flee ecstasy same thing love thing okay so here he is convincing his beloved coy mistress his mistress is very shy uh his mistress is a protestant 
so she has got uh, her moral values are so strict she is so uh, strict and uh, you know highly moralized lady so she is not ready to offer him the sexual favors which he is seeking from her had we but world enough and time this coiner's lady were no crime we would sit down and think this way to talk and pass our long love day though by indian ganges size should ruby's fine i by tight of humber would complain i would love you 10 years before flood and you should if you please refuse till the conversion of jews my vegetable love should grow and vaster than empire slow uh, empires and more slow so let me tell you something the way he convinces trying to convince his reader see it's very interesting he is seeking sexual favors hmm, uh, from his beloved okay she is den denying him hmm, because of her um, protestant background she cannot offer him uh, what he is seeking so he is trying to convince by uh, by yeah yeah by laying so many evidences by showing her so many uh proof and evidence is trying to convince her see we don't have in we are not immortals hmm? we are mortals uh, we are prone to death isn't it uh we are, yeah we are subjected to death we can die uh, we may die any time we are we are not going to be young as uh, uh young forever hmm? we, we we will lose this vigor and beauty some day so before that we should make love make the make out the best when it is possible carpe diem is the theme okay carpe diem see is the day that is the theme had we but in a, uh, had we but world enough time and this coiner's lady were no crime so he's asking his lady see if we have uh, enough space and time on earth then your shyness wasn't a crime my lady mm, okay you may shy now you are so shy uh, okay uh, it is genuine but i would have appreciated it if we have enough time and space on earth we would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long lost day so if we had enough time then we would have sit down and talked about how to pass the day okay uh, how we how we are going to spend this day we, if we had time we would have talked like that you could have uh, you know if we have more time then you could have walked by the uh, bank of river ganga indian ganges then you could have though by indian ganges side should rubies find i by the time see if we had enough time then you could have taken a walk by the uh, side of river ganga i would have walked by the uh, bank of river humber looking for rubies and complaining about my unreciprocated love see i would love you 10 years before the flood and you should if you please refuse so if we had enough and more time that means if we were immortals then i would have loved you 10 years before the flood because we know that uh, uh the flood that is mentioned in bible okay okay so we know that it had happened a long time before this is a long long time before so i would have loved you long before longer before that okay if we had enough time i would have proposed you the before the great flood and you could have <laughs> you could have uh, refused till the conversion of all christians into jew this is not this, see that type of conversion is not possible isn't it isn't it that is a what do you call it? impossible thing is it possible for the entire christians to convert into jews no it will not be possible so he says uh, he puts two impossible conditions here if we were immortals if we had enough time on this earth then i would have proposed you 10 years before the time of flood mentioned in bible and you could have rejected or you could have denied all my uh, advances and proposal until all christians turns uh, yeah turn into jew anyway that is not possible my vegetable love should grow vaster than empire and more slow see the comparison so my vegetable love here it is a metaphor why the love is compared to a vegetable because you know uh, we cannot compare love to that of animals or human beings or anything that is um, animate okay anything that is capable of moving from one place to another but the peculiarity of vegetables or the trees or the plants is that they don't have any specific uh, period of growth they will grow until they die isn't it plants shrubs trees they will grow until they uh, die isn't it so similarly he says that if we had enough time then my love for you would have 
grown and grown and it would have become a vast empire and in a more slow manner it would have flourished hmm? but my love is not a vegetable love we we are not vegetables we are not plants we are not trees hmm? we may die any time and 100 years should go to praise thine eyes on thy forehead gaze so he says that see if we had many more years to live then i would have taken 100 years to praise your eyes hmm? your forehead and 200 years to adore your each breast and 30000 years to uh, enjoy rest of the body parts so he says that if we were immortal then i would have dedicated 100 years for your eyes uh, 200 years for your breast 30 years for different body parts and age to least to every part hmm? so like like that i would uh, allocate uh, different different age for different body parts but and last year at the last stage i want to see your heart like that i would have loved you because you deserve it you're such a beautiful lady lady you deserve this uh, yeah appreciation you're such a beautiful and very what do you call refined lady nor would i love at a lower rate i don't know how to love you in a, a lower rate in a lower style okay but at my back but these things are not possible since we are uh immort uh, since we are mortals these things are not possible but at my back i always hear times wing chariot hurrying near and yonder all before us lie deserts of was eternity thy beauty shall no more uh, no more be found nor in thy marble wall shall sound my echoing song then worms shall cry that long preserved virginity and your queen honor turns to dust and into ashes all my lust so in this uh, stanza he says that see we don't have enough time. I can hear the time's wing chariot. Again, what do you call it? The meta, uh, metaphysical conceit. He, co he compares time to that of a chariot. He says that time is passing like a chariot. Hmm? So I can hear it is coming. So yonder all be before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Before us what is lying is a desert. Okay. Uh, let me tell you, you uh, please don't think that we have enough and more opportunity. Uh, what is ahead is a desert because this beauty or this uh, chance will not last forever. Okay, someday, someday we will become old, we will die. No, in thy marble wall shall sound my echoing song, then worms shall cry. So he said that, see, me and you, we are not going to be young forever. We will die someday. And it is not possible for me to hug you in the marble vault. That means in the tomb, no one is going to hug you. No one is going to uh, kiss you. And my echoing song, then worm shall cry, the long preserved virginity. See, because of your sense of consciousness, moral consciousness, you are preserving your virginity. Hmm? You are preserving your virginity. Uh, see, if you are not allowing me to enjoy your virginity, then who is going to enjoy it? At the time of death, worms will try your virginity. They will take away, away your virginity. At, the, at that time, all your honors will turn to dust and all my lusts will turn to ashes. Okay. So here, beloved is preserving her virginity because of her moral consciousness or the honor. Because of, to protect her family, honor. And he says that at the time of the death, who is going to relish it? Worms. And at, at that time, all her long preserved virginity will turn to dust and all his love for her will turn to ashes. The grave is a fine and a private place, and but none, I think, do their embrace. Now, therefore, I while the youth you sit on the skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every post with instant fires. Now, let us quote us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devote than languish in his slow chap power let us roll all our strength all our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life thus though we cannot make our son stand still yet we will make him run so he again says that see okay graveyard is a fine place it's a very private place but don't you think don't think that someone is going to hug you there so you do uh, so you may best enjoy uh the present time because now you are young you have the you are healthy you have that hue on your skin hmm? your skin is so radiant you can enjoy more sensitive uh to my love so you know so 
you may please yeah you may enjoy while you can try to gather the roses while you can while thy willing soul transpires every pore with my instant fire so whenever i approach you of course you will be uh, there will be sparks uh, in your skin so try to enjoy the present situation now let us support us while we may so let us make love while we can let us enjoy the love just like love birds amorous birds of prey rather at once our time devote than languish in his slow sharp power okay so see time is moving fast so let us devote it let us roll at uh, roll all our strength and all our sweetness into bowl so let us roll into a bowl okay let us roll this is sexual connotation he says that he and his beloved uh, let us form a bowl hmm? by making love let us form a bowl and let us uh, shoot that bowl into the iron gates of life he's asking that means a uh, iron gates of life means those restricts i mean restrictions in protestant life so he is against that restrictions in protestant life so he really wanted to what he called um mm, uh break all those laws that is why he says that let us form a bowl and shoot into the iron gates of life okay it is not possible to make the sun stand still so sun stand still means to make the time stand still because who is responsible for the very passing of the time sun is responsible for the very uh passing of the time so that is why he says that it is if we cannot make our sun stand still if we, it is not possible for human beings to uh still the time but we can make him run faster if we are engaged in an activity that we love of course time will move faster isn't it now the next poem is garden <laughs> so let me tell you something unlike uh, john done this person is a misogynist in the previous poem he says that okay come lady let us make love uh it is the best time to enjoy hmm? uh while we may uh where well, see because we are mortals so we may die any time we won't get enough chance and space on this earth uh so he's convincing his lady at his best to make love in this in this uh, poem uh, he has got misogynistic attitude and he is scolding end uh, the race of women kind and he says that why you men are walking behind those mortal beauties they are nothing Uh, when compared to the beauty of nature stop walking behind the ladies enjoy come and sit inside the garden and enjoy the beauty this is the very theme of the garden okay but let's see yeah how vainly men then self amaze to win palm and oak so yeah in this couple of lines he says that uh see men are simply wasting their time uh to win palm oak and base i mean uh, in ancient uh days in egypt sorry in all uh, greece uh during olympic days you know men are simply competing simply wasting their energy so has to win the mere leaf or, or what do you call it, the crown made of olive olive palm and oak so they are wasting their day their energy laboring a lot toiling a lot from morning to evening okay so what is the very need why are you wasting your time laboring for something that is futile come and enjoy who shot narrow was shake that prudently their toil are braid while all flowers all trees do close weave a garland of repose come and enjoy and sit in the garden see where all flowers and all trees will what they will weave a garden garland of repose they will give you a perfect rest now fair quiet and have i found you be here and innocent thy sister dear so fair quiet in the two lines he has personified fair i mean quietness and innocence so quietness and innocence are the two qualities that you can only see in nature isn't it human beings are very shrewd we are not innocent but nature is very quiet and innocent so these are the two qualities uh, that you can only see in garden okay so that is why he uh, personified it so he personified quiet uh, fair quiet and innocence as two beautiful lady he says that uh these two beautiful ladies can only be seen in the garden hmm? they cannot see in the company of busy men so your sacred plants if here below only among the plants will grow so society is all root but to this delicious solitude so he is asking why are you spending time in among men and about uh, um, among those hard working people you know uh 
they are very rude society is all but rude and pretentious come and enjoy the company of the nature no white no red was ever seen so amorous as this lovely green so see 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 no white no red again personification uh not personification say like uh as in not uh the where white and red stands for women white skin and red painted lips so no girl with white complexion and red lips uh is as beautiful as oh nature see nature lovely green nature is more beautiful than any other women you know there are many cruel lovers for their uh satisfaction they carve the names of their lover on the trees there are many people isn't it you might have seen in movies or you uh, if you have gone to many different places you might have seen people carve the names of their beloveds on the trees so he says it's such a cruel act you know if i ever carve the tree then it will be for writing the name of the tree i will not write any woman's name on the tree if i ever carve the bark of a tree then it will be to write the name of the tree now when we have run our passions heat love hither makes his best retreat the gods that mortal beauty chase still in a treat and the race apollo hunter daphne so only that she might love yeah so in this poem you know uh, he says that almost all chase of love had ended in the tree isn't it <laughs> in films you can see lover and beloved running around the tree after they have become tired they will come uh, under the tree to take rest that is one uh, yeah connotation another one is there are so many stories uh, in greek mythology and roman mythology where almost the mortal chase see apollo ha uh, has chased chased daphne a mortal beauty and his chase has ended in um, olive tree uh, yeah she has become a what do you call a laurel tree okay uh, somebody has turned her into a laurel tree hmm? then pan another pan means god of shepherds he too chased strings and she had become a what a reed uh, a, a a plant out of which he made a flute so all those amorous chases have almost ended in trees what wondrous life in this i lead ripe apples drop about my head so he says that now he is walking in an uh, orchard uh, in that uh, uh, garden there are different types of fruits yeah veins then what do you call melons so he was walking through uh, walking in the middle of those fruits so if he tries a little bit he can even suck the nectar of the grapes hmm, that so he is blessed in the company of uh, plants animals sorry plants trees and fruits so at that time you know while walking through the garden he stumbled down on the melon tendrils so at that time you know his heart came out of his body and it sits on the uh, tree okay <clears throat> yeah uh so he says that garden is a place which can uh make him forget about all worldly things it uh, it is powerful enough to uh, render him all sort of happiness hmm? he really want to come back and he wanted to stay in the uh, beautiful company of plants and trees so he says that after falling on the ground his heart has come out of his body now it is like a like a bird it is sitting on the branch of a tree preparing for his next flight that means he has become so imaginative poet has become so imaginative in the company of beautiful plants and flowers in the garden whereas if he is in the company of busy men he would have become irritated now again he says that such was the happy state guard aha uh -huh. yeah happy garden state while men there walk without a mate after a place so pure and sweet so you know he say again say he says that um yeah uh man hu human being was re really happy actually adam was really happy without the company of uh eve in eden isn't it 
it is after the entry of eve in the paradise that adam has lost his celestial position or the divine happiness isn't it they have committed that original sin and both of them had been fallen from the what the garden so he says that he was enjoying double bliss in the garden before the entry of eve so green plants are more beautiful or more fair or more peaceful than women see thereafter in the next stanza he is praising the gardener who is you know uh, bringing up who is taking care of these plants in the garden he says that he is a skilled craftsman hmm? just like the bee you know uh, bees they are also workers they are industrious workers isn't it he is a skilled craftsman and uh, he had you know um, cut and trimmed and crafted the plant to grow in such a a uh, way that it can uh, time the very time change can be easily understood from the garden isn't it it uh, it has yeah compute its time as well as bee so these working bee compares he says that bees mm, those uh, industrious bees they are too good in calculating time as good as human beings so when sun moves in the sky the shadow that is reflected upon the trees and plants from that we can compute the very um, passage of time how could such sweet and wholesome hours be reckoned with herbs and flowers so one can only spend such beautiful hours in the company uh, hours and hours in the company of flowers isn't it see it is impossible for anyone to come uh, spend long hours in the midst of busy men but you can spend hours and hours in the company of beautiful flowers and trees now i told you this person next poem horatian or is a very <clears throat> famous poem and i told you he is an opportunist at first he is a porter charles first thereafter after the death of charles first you know charles had uh, first was beheaded in 1649 thereafter oliver cromwell access to the throne yeah he has uh, ex- uh, became the ruler of the england and he is a protestant and he uh, all theaters were closed and he uh, he has in you know he has in english any kind of art forms uh, or the so called musical art in england so here the poet is justifying oliver cromwell he says that see oliver cromwell uh, doesn't have enough time to read books or sit uh, lazy just like other kings of england hearing music or listening to dance for uh, yeah listening to music or seeing dance performance because he was always busy guarding england okay he's not like other uh, kings other inactive kings in england he's an active star okay he's a forward youth who was who was always busy protecting england uh, uh in this poem i told you uh Andrew Marvel is originally justifying our Oliver Cromwell. Okay, thereafter he says that uh, he has his own reason for killing Charles First. Hmm? Uh, you know, uh, he has also worked under King Charles First, and he says that he just, actually this poem is neutral in nature. He praises both, both Oliver Cromwell and Charles First. So you cannot simply complain Oliver Cromwell for beheading Charles First because it is natural when a bigger spirit come to a room, lower spirit has to make room for it. So simple, simple thing has happened. You know this type of political changes or change in power happens. It, it, it is quite natural. Mm, that is a rule of cosmos or the cos. It's a rule of uh, cosmic. Mm, when a bigger thing comes or a fair thing come, the slower thing has to. give space for it make space for it similarly charles had was uh charles second was uh beheaded but charles second he is also uh, second to none because you know when he was beheaded when he was um, executed in front of the parliamentarians we know that those people who supported protestants or the parliaments were known as whigs and those people who supported royalty they were known as tories or followers of charles first you know when he was executed in front of the parliamentarians you know he had been uh, shown the slightest trace of fear on his face he had met the 
edge of the war with even sharper edge of his eyes charles first even though he was beheaded by oliver cromwell he was never uh, a coward or a timid he met the edge of the sword with even sharper edge of his yeah uh i okay so this person is responsible for adding more and more provisions into england okay this person has glorified england after it, it says that after elizabethan era so golden period of england is under queen elizabeth and uh, she was you know very uh, zest really successful very enthusiastic patron to many poets mm. artist and also you know she encourage all sort of adventures expeditions raids etc and under her region also england has fl flourished a lot after that it is under oliver cromwell's region england had added more provinces to uh, the land okay say like added ireland um, then scotland uh, yeah like that so this person has been to many scandinavian uh, lands scotland uh, and uh, they were able to defeat those soldiers so he says that it is you know really futile to wage war with oliver cromwell hmm? because none can defeat him so this is a very summary of uh, horatio note very simple poem now now let's discuss about <clears throat> george herbert so george herbert is a, a priest by profession not like uh, andrew marvel or john dunn he is spiritual na nature he is religious okay he, he, he is a full priest okay not like uh, andrew uh, uh, what do you call john dunn who has become a priest after the death of his wife okay actually he has forcefully made a priest so henry wogan called him a most glorious saint and a seal okay see he was well versed in english latin and greek and all his poems were posthumously published he has sent his poem to his friend uh, nicolas ferrer and asked him to get published if it is worthy enough hmm? so all his poems were posthumously published so john yeah john herbert poetry speeches let's see it is religious full of religious themes mod play use of conceit hmm, intricate themes and he is the one who has written pattern poems pattern poems means if you are discussing about church your poem will be appearing in the form of church it will it will have the shape of a church if you are discussing about the cross obviously the poem the lines will be shaped in the poem in the shape of a cross if you are discussing about the heart the 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 lines will be patterned into the shape of heart that is pattern poem okay he is the one he, who has introduced the pattern poem or the shape poem in english carmen figuratum or altar poems so carmen figuratum is a latin expression where the lines of the poems are fitted or shaped in such a way that uh, they reflect the theme or the idea that is discussed in the poem okay now yeah common themes in his poetry repentance redemption christ's martyrdom man's relationship with god man's submissiveness to god for ultimate salvation reconciliation so almost all his poem has got similar themes similar themes basically salvation redemption so let's see you see the this is called a shape poem see see the poem has got a shape isn't it but if you now it is in a horizontal shape but if you hold this poem in a vertical position you can see it has got the shape of a wing see the title of the poem is easter wing that is the main idea the main idea of the poem is east wings uh, the shape of the poem is also uh, what what do you call the lines have been shaped in such a way that it appears like a wing so let me tell you lord uh, in this poem wherever he discusses about the mercy of god the lines are expanded the lines are longer when he talks about the folly of men lines are shorter or contracted okay so according to the salvation lines will uh, again uh, it will get increased when he is talking about the mistake or the sin that is committed by man it will again decrease that's the very pattern of this poem 
So he says that Lord who created the man in the well stores, though foolishly he lost fame and decaying more and more till he became more poor with thee. Oh, let me rise and oh, lock harmoniously and sing this day thy victories and then shall thy shall further the flight in me. So he says that when man has created, uh, sorry, when he, God has created the man, uh, he has created him in full wealth and store. Actually, man himself has lost all those amenities, all those luxury in his full uh, gain. That means the, uh, due to the original sin, man has lost everything. And he is decaying more and more. See, nowadays he is becoming more and more poor. Uh, so in that, uh, in where he discusses the very folly or the very mistake of the human being, uh, he contracts the line. Thereafter, he is asking God to uplift him, to give him wings. Oh, let me rise as a lark. He is asking God, oh, I just want to uh, rise. I, I just want to become closer to you by becoming a songbird. Please lift me up. There, he again expands the line. Now, my tender ages uh, in sorrow did I begin, and still the sickness and shame, though it is so punish sin that I became most thin. So he says that, you know, in my tender age, I have uh, my life was full of sorrow. I have committed a lot of mistake. For that, I am getting this disease. So this, you know, something George Herbert all throughout his life he was afflicted with a lot of sufferings and a lot of diseases. For that reason, he says that, you know. Maybe uh, right now I'm suffering because of the mistakes I have done in my tender age. Let me combine and feel thy victory. For if my way on thine, affliction shall at once the flight in me. So he says that, okay, I can understand uh, uh, why you have given me so much suffering. See, only your sufferings can sal uh, provide salvation, isn't it? One will get purified only after going through intense suffering. Your soul will get purified after undergoing to intense suffering. That affliction means spiritual suffering. So you are trying to, actually, God is trying to fix a wing upon the poet so that someday he will uh, rise to that position. From his suffering, he can uh, advance to God. <laughs> Now the next poem is Caller. So in the poem Caller, uh, Caller is a, what do you call it? It's a pun, okay. A word play. There are two meanings for Caller. One is the Caller of a suit of the priest. Another Caller is a restriction. Hmm? There are two meanings. One is a genuine Caller of the shirt. Another one is restriction. Uh, so here the restriction, you know, the priesthood. The suit of a priest offers George Herbert some kind of restrictions, isn't it? Since he is a priest, he is not able to enjoy life like others. So he is very much frustrated. He is asking, oh, he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he struck the board and he is crying, never, never ever I will continue this torturous life. Why I should continue this, you know, life full of suffering? I have still fruit in front of me. I can still enjoy my love. Why I should deny all those pleasures? Why I should? Okay. Uh, so... Yeah, uh, he is complaining. He's complaining that, see, he has wasted all his life simply serving the God and he hasn't gained anything. Uh, no, see, his road is fine and free. It's a straight line. No one, uh, no one is there to guide or restrict him. So he's going to renounce that profession. But soon after uh, his complaints, he heard a call from the God, my child. Uh, okay. But then he uh, he says, <clears throat> then towards the end of the poem, he reunites with the God, my Lord. Even though he has got law, he's, he has made a lot of supplications or complaints in front of God, saying all his uh, life uh, was wasted hmm? uh, and uh, he was forced to spend them in suffering. Hmm? Why he is wasting his life? He hasn't gained anything. Hmm? And he again says that no one is there to restrict him. So why should he continue such a life? <clears throat> but after you know in Kala he reunites with the God affliction also has the same thing uh, affliction is a group of poem of five uh, yeah it's a collection uh, what, do, what do you call po poetry collection uh, of five poems affliction one same theme of Kala you know uh, he joined this profession thinking that he'll be getting many uh, glories or initially by seeing the 
external pomposity of a church life or a clergy life he joined he became a clergy person but after entering into the priesthood only uh, if priesthood professionally he understood the very difficulty in that profession he has lost all his dear and near ones he couldn't uh, he could uh, now he is not getting enough chance to spend time with his dear and near ones uh, so has to uh, make him continue in this profession he says that god has uh, offered him lot of degrees knowledge a hmm? uh, lot of uh, academic uh, yeah accolades just like that god had bribed him god had bribed him to continue in this profession okay so he is complaining god that okay from in a way god has betrayed him uh, or uh, bribed him to make him continue in this profession and all uh, see he all throughout his life he has witnessed the loss of his friends uh, all his well wishers were died okay so poet you know he says that actually he had enough and more opportunity because uh, he 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 had aristocratic birth okay unlike john dun and andrew marvel uh, george herbert he had an aristocratic uh, origin hmm? if he wanted he could have enjoyed a better life but still he doesn't know why he had chosen this profession or else he says that god has trapped him but you know uh uh again god had made him um, <clears throat> pulled him into more uh sufferings by giving him more disease so that he will never come out of that profession see once he is okay only he'll be able to enjoy the worldly life okay so in order to make him at first god had bribed in a good way by giving him academic accolades uh, or all sort of amenities like that but later to make him uh, fix in this profession he had given him many diseases so that he will never go away from god so he says that god has tricked with him later he understands that what god uh, you know whatever god has done it is for his goodness and again he uh, gets reunited with god same thing has that of kala now love another beautiful poem where love is the god okay he compares uh, god to that of love after the death uh, he wants to he is trying to enter the heaven okay so who is the host of the heaven god so love is the host okay love so guilty of dust and sin so this person uh, you know is weighed down um, because of his uh, sin he cannot face god he cannot enter the the abode hmm? the heavenly abode because he feels that he is not worthy enough to enjoy the heavenly life at that time who is the ghost when he approached the door <clears throat> the door gate of uh, yeah the door of heaven lord that is love the god appears there and uh, he says that okay i am not worthy i have done so many mistake i have been ungrateful i have been unkind see so the uh, god asks him okay leave it dear uh you can come in i am ready to accept see just jesus christ is the uh, yeah jesus christ actually he has taken all the sufferings all the burden of human kind isn't it that is why he was crucified yeah similarly god after the death george herbert says that god is ready to handle all his burden and ready to accept him but he is not he cannot look upon um, god because of the mistakes he have complete committed he cannot look into the eyes of love love took my hand and smiling did reply who made thy eyes but i so he is asking god see if you have committed some mistake maybe it is due to my decision who had given you hand who had given you eyes hmm? it's me so you have every right to look into my eyes please hand over your hands you are very welcome into the heaven so here the god is <clears throat> encouraging the poet or consoling the poet who thinks that he has committed grave mistake and he is not worthy enough to enter the heaven the love is the god okay police was also yet another beautiful poem where author has used greek mythology puli you know the one puli that we used to fetch water from the well another puli which he discusses in the poem is the puli that 
God uses to lift man to uh, closer to the God. Okay, <clears throat> the pulley that God uses uh, to fetch man closer to Him. So here in this poem, uh, George Herbert says that when God created man, He has given him all kind of blessings, all sort of blessings. Hmm? He has bestowed him with all worldly gifts, all worldly happiness. Just like, uh, yeah, thereafter, he pours for a second. See, let us say that he pour on him all we can. Let's world riches uh, which disperse lie and contract into span. Okay, so God has given him one by one. Say like beauty, wisdom, honor, pleasure. Hmm? After bestowing upon, uh, yeah, bestowing all these gifts upon man, he pours for a while. God stayed, uh, yeah, for a while and stopped pouring or po stopped bestowing those gifts. And uh, when he opened the glass box, hmm, there is only one gift remi remain, that is rest. Even though God has given gifts like beauty, wisdom, honor, pleasure, God had withheld one gift, that is rest. Okay, God hasn't given the gift of rest to man. Why? Because if God is offering the gift of rest to man, the man will never become closer to God. Isn't it? So, you know, however, the per it doesn't matter how, how, much the per how much rich the person is or how much clever the person is or how much lucky the person is. If he is restless, obviously he will come to God to seek his blessing. That is why God has withheld the gift of what he called Press. There is a small uh, mythology here. In Greek philosophy, there is, uh, I hope you know, Prometheus. Prometheus, right? So Prometheus has stolen fire from the heaven and given it to the um, human beings. So Zeus has become very angry. So he decided to punish uh, human beings uh, uh, more. First of all, he punished Prometheus by chaining him to the rock uh, and uh, attacking him um, with vultures during daytime like that but he wanted to punish human beings more so you know what he did he created pandora you know pandora uh, and he gift uh, he has given all sort of gifts to pandora and all other gods just like in hindu philosophy hindu mythology hanuman and ganesh all were given a lot of blessings boons by different deities similarly pandora also got different blessings and boons from different gods Thereafter, she she was sent to earth with a glass box, and God told him not to. Zeus told her not to open it. But we know basically human beings are very, very you know very anxious, very curious to know certain things, isn't it? If we are told not to open something, not uh, don't to, uh, uh, not uh, to do something, obviously we'll be doing that thing first, isn't it? So purposely, Zeus has given her such an advice because he knows that some point of. Uh, 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 time in her life she will try to open that box and you know Pandora has forgotten all about her previous life she entered the earth and she married a earthly man and she has begotten children thereafter one day she has become she uh, 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 she has become very curious and she opened uh, the Pandora's I mean the box that has been given to her by Zeus you know when she opened it all sort of evils came out of the box evil greed uh, yeah evil things greedy uh, jealousy all sort of you know inhumanely things came out of the box that's how you know zeus punished the human beings for stealing the fire so there is a small mythology lies hidden in this poem so redemption is another beautiful poem you know here here, here the uh, poet compares himself to a tenant and God to that of a landlord, and uh, yeah, his um, you know his business for the year is not that profitable, so he's searching the tenant to make a, a contract again. But when when he went to the heaven, uh, he got the information that his uh, lord is not there; he has gone to some other land that is earth, uh, which he has dearly brought. And when he sees finally, when he sees the God on earth uh, he sees that he was surrounded by robbers 
pirates okay thieves and but at the before uh, before dying god has granted his wish that means land lord has granted his wish and made him free from the what he called uh, the tax okay and uh, rec- uh, he has he has given him the contract again that means here uh, the theme that is hidden is uh, the crucifixion of jesus christ isn't it when jesus christ was crucified so many people uh, were given salvation even though he had bore the burden of um, mankind even at the time of his death he was able to grant the wishes of those uh, people who believed in him similarly the landlord landlord is the god and tenant is the poet even at the time of his death he has never uh fail to take care of the wishes of his followers now window window is also a very beautiful poem where he compares uh church is the god church church is the god and window is the poet so you know uh if you have been to church you might have seen the church windows church windows are very colorful and so many stories are annihilated isn't it you, uh, you might have, uh, yeah in big in big big cathedrals you can see stories engraved on the windows so how it is possible so in order to uh, become uh, you know colorful uh, glasses or stories to be engraved on the glass the glass has to undergo uh, annihilation uh, what do you call it has to undergo extreme pressure and heat then only uh, they will be able to engrave stories or pictures on the church glasses so similarly he compares himself to that of a window in the church uh if he wants to uh, spread the story of jesus christ or the biblical stories or to direct the other people or uh, to become a more blessed soul he has to undergo extreme suffering then only he will become unbreakable so in order to become unbreakable one has to undergo extreme suffering okay so that is the ideology what is conveyed in the window so i told you church is the god and window is the what our poet okay so normal glasses are very brittle bleak and thin okay but once you become a holy thing hmm, you will become truly unbreakable just like the church windows now the last poem aaron aaron means the robe of a robe the suit or the costume of a priest that is mentioned in old testament so in the old testament uh yeah there has been given some dress code for priest so whenever a true priest when, uh, comes people will be knowing him just because he holds a bell and a celestial uh, a precious gem on his chest so that chest is uh, yeah that gem is enough to purify the souls when he, uh, yeah when they hear when people hear the sounds of the bell made by the aaron all the dead spirits will uh, rise from the grave and all the dead uh, evil spirits they will go away from him so you know holiness on head light perfection on the breast harmonious bell below rising the dead to lead them to life and rest so those priests mentioned in old testament they are very holy they are very holy in nature on looking on their breast people will easily understand that they are holy beings because light and perfection is very much visible on their forehead and in their breast and they have got that celestial gem uh, in their chest and they were capable of raising dead souls from their graveyard and they redirecting them to a better life but poet says that see instead of uh, light and perfection what he has in his head is profaneness hmm? he 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 is ma- uh, full of defects and darkness our uh, george herbert is full of defect and darkness hmm? uh, so a noise of passion ringing me for dead unto a place where no is rest so what he can hear is the passion of dead hmm? a passion ringing for dead uh he is so afraid uh, you know he is so afraid to die and he thinks that he uh, there is no rest offered to him 
okay poor priest thus i am dressed so i don't have any gaudy dress hmm? some dress codes have been mentioned please go through the poem some dress codes have been mentioned tumbling some gems hmm, robes bells Hmm? Worn by Aaron. Aaron is a priest that is mentioned in Old Testament. So they have their own dress codes. So, but he is a poor. Uh, George Herbert says that he is a poor uh, priest and he doesn't have that much celestial dress code or celestial dressing pattern. He's a poor priest. So he is asking Jesus Christ to become his robe, become his dress. Okay. So here, Jesus Christ is compared to a dress, a, a, a priest costume, Aaron. Hmm? And so by wearing Jesus Christ, he too will become holy, like the Aaron mentioned in Old Testament. So that's all about block three. So I hope you were able to understand at, at least the outline of the poems. Actually, we have so many um, poems in this block. More, yeah, somewhat around 20 to 25 poems are there in the block. Okay, then next week we'll discuss block four. Bye. Okay. Thank you, ma'am.